Yoko. <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm not very comfortable with public speaking, so please bear with me. <laughs> In prison, I was allowed one monthly visit, uh, one family member for 20 minutes. That meant that my mom and sister had to take turns. A national security officer would sit between us. He would put his phone on the table and record our conversation. I was allowed to hug my visitor twice, when they arrived and right before they left. I had a routine for that special day. I would braid my hair, put makeup on, stuff I wouldn't do in freedom. I did my best to look well for my family because seeing them <coughs> fueled me with enough joy to keep me going for the rest of the month until the next visit. <coughs> there was one visit, that of September 2021. It was different. I entered the room and my sister Mona looked like a mess. Her hands were shaking. Something was wrong. She told me that Ale, my older brother, he had a court hearing and as usual, family members were not allowed in, but the lawyers managed to see him and <clears throat> he spoke about suicide. He told the judge, my life is unbearable. I can't take this any longer. Transfer me from this facility or I will end my life. <clears throat> I was devastated, but not surprised. The truth is, I could see it coming. Let me sum up the past nine years for my family. <clears throat> Ale is permanently in prison. Whenever he finishes a sentence, the regime just finds new treasures, charges to convict him with. I try to campaign for his release. They arrest me and throw me in prison. The people outside campaign for my release. I get released. I go back to campaigning. I get rearrested and so on. In the meantime, the things that matter most in life, we were missing them. Uh, Alex's son was born while his father was in prison. We both lost our father while we were behind bars. And during those dark years, my brother was a source of strength and inspiration to us. But I knew that eventually we'd get to this point when he decided that this life is not a life worth living. I was proud of him that he'd endured all these years and that what really got to him was not the physical torture, it was the deprivation of everything that made life bearable. Sunshine, sound, music, books, more than anything really books. I live like an animal, he said, my brain is stopping. The brain needs input. It can't keep running on empty. Thankfully, Ale is no longer in that mental place now. But I have to tell you, there is no happy ending to this tale. My brother remains in prison. My story is not one about success, strength, or freedom. It's a story of defeat, vulnerability, resilience and the beauty of solidarity. It is the only story my generation, the Arab Spring generation, have left to tell. We dreamed of democracy, we came very close, and then we ended up with military coups and wars. My brother, apart from being a software developer, is a writer. Alet's words once landed in mainstream Egyptian newspapers, now under the rule of our current military dictator, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, they survive in the margins in one of the remaining independent media outlets in Egypt, on scrapes of paper smuggled out of jail, in the memories of those who have stood with him in a courtroom and heard him recite full essays to the judge because he had no pen and paper. Then came a glimpse of hope. Some amazing people, an anonymous collective, they decided to put together Alat's writings, translate it, put it together in an English book titled You Have Not Yet Been Defeated. 
I heard about it in a letter while I was still in prison, and I cried. The warmth of solidarity breached my cell, and it reminded me that my small family is not alone in this fight. Someone out there cares. Someone has our backs. 20th of December, 2021, on my birthday, my brother was sentenced to another five years for <coughs> sharing a Facebook post about a prisoner who died of torture. This most recent sentencing should presumably end in 2027. Three days later, I was released. I knew I had to do things differently. I couldn't continue campaigning and advocating from inside Egypt. It was, the price was too high for me and for the people helping us. So I started flying around the world with Alet's book. From London to DC, Paris, Brussels, Berlin, Geneva, knocking on the doors of every diplomat and politician I could reach. And through my family's story, I tried to tell the wider story about the situation in Egypt. Under CC, there's around 60,000 political prisoners like my brother, all trapped behind bars watching their lives pass by. April last year, in parallel with my travels, my brother started a prolonged hunger strike. He would adapt his strike according to the responsiveness of the authorities. When they finally allowed him books, he allowed himself 200 calories of liquids a day. The peak was last November. During COP27, the UN climate conference hosted by Egypt, the regime were trying to use the conference to greenwash their crimes. They didn't want the story of political prisoners to ruin their PR stunt. So I decided to take a calculated risk and fly in and attend the conference. My brother decided to escalate by depriving himself from all food and water. In the conference halls, climate activists from all over the world chanted Alec's name, expressing solidarity with all those unjustly detained in Egypt. The powerful solidarity made world leaders pay attention to our plea to free Alec. Rishi Sunak, Olaf Scholz, Emmanuel Macron called for my brother's release. Meanwhile, Alec was battling death. His body collapsed, and the prison authorities had to put him on drips. And he woke up terrified of how close he came to the end. And he thought of us. He thought about a recent letter he got telling him that my sister Mona was pregnant. He could sense that something was shifting. His prison conditions were improving. He didn't know much about what was happening outside, but he knew in his heart that we must be fearlessly campaigning for him. And so he allowed himself some hope. <clears throat> and he started eating again. Today, I like and feel the sun, listen to music, read books, watch football. And more importantly, he's been transferred away from his torture to a relatively better prison facility. Of course, he's still denied many of his rights, consular access from the British Embassy. He's denied consular access. We are dual nationals, but the Egyptian authorities will not acknowledge my brother's British citizenship, and the British government are allowing them to get, a, to get away with it. We were still only able to see him once a month behind the glass barrier. And Alet's son, my nephew, he's on the spectrum. He has autism and he's nonverbal. So he can't communicate with his father through the prison's phone speakers. So Alet has not seen his son in years. But still, we've come a long way from Alet living like an animal and wanting to die to this place where he has a little bit of hope and is fighting to live. Alet today feels more connected to the outside world, and that connection was made possible thanks to solidarity. The other 60,000 need hope too, and the more you care, the freer they will become. So, how can you help? Stay aware, follow us on social media, check our website. But if you really want to help, then use your democratic rights to challenge the kind of relationships that exist between your governments and ours, because the current state of those relationships are enforcing our oppressor. 
As Ale once said, fix your own democracy. This has always been my answer to the question, how can we help? A setback for human rights in a place where democracy has deep roots is certain to be used as an excuse for even worse violations in societies where rights are more fragile. We reach out to you, not in search of powerful allies, but because we confront the same global problems and share universal values with a firm belief in the power of solidarity. After this forum, I will fly back to Cairo and as usual, I will be stopped at passport control. They will tell me to wait for the security clearance. It could take hours or minutes of waiting and not knowing whether I'll end up in the comfort of my home or back in prison. But while waiting, I will be able to comfort myself knowing that we're not alone in this, someone out there cares, and if worse comes to worse, they will have my back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.